Hello. Morning. He is looking for another connector.
você pode voltar aquela tela que estava aqui antes? Yes. Now we can start. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to uh, introduce uh, the second workshop on regional climate modeling and stream events over South America. This is a workshop organized for various institutions, uh, ICTP, University of São Paulo, CONICET, UNESP, University de la República, Uruguay, Faculty of Science, Charles University in Klein, and the, the money comes from FAPESP in Klein and the ICTP. I hope you have a success in this week to work with regional climate modeling. Uh, we, the workshop is organized in the morning. You, you have the, some uh, talks in the afternoon. Uh, we, you, we, we have some activities, uh, lab activities with regional modeling and with uh, statistical downscale. Um, here is the Wi-Fi, Yagenet, and the, the user is BregCM, and the password is this one. We can copy, okay? So now I will we, we, we start with uh, Erika Coppola, that uh, you talk about uh, So good morning, everybody. I am Erika Coppola. I come from ICTP in Trieste. This is the second time we come in Sao Paulo to have this workshop together with Rosemary, uh, with Marta, and with all the other that institute that Rosemary mentioned. I don't want to repeat. Uh, we have a long uh, way back collaboration with them. They always visit us during our workshop, and we work together on many uh, scientific uh, uh, paper. So it's a pleasure to be here and to keep going this activity and to bring a little bit of ICTP in uh, Sao Paulo. Although you have a little bit of us in Sao Paulo, there is an institute that is called ICTP SAIF here in Sao Paulo, but there is no the climate section yet. Maybe one day, who knows? <laughs> it will be there as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. 
The purpose of this first talk is just to let you know where we are in uh, regional climate modeling with our regional climate modeling, where we are, at which point we are, what is available, what is possible to do, um, and also a little bit more in a broad uh, view. Uh, there will be Silvina that will speak about Cordex, and we are contributing to Cordex as well, South America, and Cordex all over the other region. Um, so I will just say what our model can do, uh, and then you will have more in-depth um, knowledge during the lab session. Uh, and there will be also an, ex an extra section that is uh, new. It's like the second time that we are running this section with Francesca, in which we want also to speak about which kind of uh, uh, scientific question we want to answer and how, which is the method we want to use and what is uh, reasonable to do and what is not reasonable to do by using this uh, kind of technique, okay? Okay, so uh, the, mm, in uh, ICTP we are, <coughs> it's long, there are many years we are developing this re regional climate model called Rexiam that was starting with the the father of the model is Filippo Giorgi, that is our head of the section. And he was coming from Boulder, where he started to work with the Graal and all the other people, the famous people in uh, regional climate and regional climate modeling. And then he came in Trieste in um, 1998, I think. And he started our uh, group over there, and we keep developing the model. Uh, since that day, we changed the model a lot. Uh, I say we because it's not uh, an effort done by a single person, but as you can imagine, by a big group. Uh, so everybody of us brings something new in the model, and then uh, we have the, the wizard of the model is Graziano that you will meet <laughs> this afternoon. So he's the one collecting uh, all our input, and uh, it's uh, is the code keeper of the model. Uh, okay, so the, the aim, our aim is to have a regional couple or system model so that it's able to represent not only the atmosphere but also the ocean and the land surface and the hydrology. And I would say that finally we are there. So in the previous edition two years ago, we still had some component not in place, but at the moment we have everything in place and I will uh, show you. So the earth system model, it's something that it's uh, exists since long time ago. So all the simulation with the global model nowadays are Earth system models. So this global model are able to couple the the hair, the land, the life, and the and the water. So in the everything that is mm, on our planet, but the regional coupling of this was still something uh, difficult to achieve because for due to the um, high <laughs> to the demand uh, of the computer resource, because you can imagine that it's much more expensive. Uh, but now there are, mm, I mean, with the increasing computer resource, we can do this, and we are doing this. So when uh, we speak about the Earth system model, you s I think you all know that we think to divide our Earth surface and our Earth atmosphere and ocean and land surface in all little grid boxes, and the feasibility of the coupling is connected to the resolution. The resolution is the size of these grid boxes. And in all this year, we were working such to reach resolu resolution that are feasible for us for this uh, um, coupled system. So the regional climate modeling technique and strategy, it's something that, just to summarize, for those of you that are new to this, why we want to use this regional technique, regional in, a, in the coupled sense. Because sometimes the resolution of the GCM is too coarse to understand some phenomena, like for example, everything connected with the land surface feedback, very local, very localized. You can think, for example, to the famous uh, La, La Plata Basin you have over here, the Amazon forest. There are many, many, many process, physical processes that are local and are connected with the land surface feedback. And then you need to go in a more in-depth analysis to, to increase the resolution and see what is happening. So 
Usually the regional climate model technique is nested within a GCM. So we use the GCM as a boundary. So the large scale information is still coming from a GCM. And then we kind of zoom in in the region that uh, it's uh, of our interest. So we need initial condition and boundary condition to drive our model. Uh, and we do this in one way nesting. So the, the, the large scale, the global model, it's feeding the regional model, but it's not true the other way around. So we are not feeding anything back yet to the global model because also this is something that is very expensive in, in a computer uh, world. So the idea is that the GCM is simulating the response, the climate response to the, um, the uh, to the large scale forcing, so it's simulating the giant circulation um, as it uh, is uh, observed on the on the Earth. But the regional climate uh, try to simulate the subgrid of this, so the local scale forcing, and it, it also provide the uh, fine scale information. Because, for example, if you are using a regional climate model and if you are zooming o over a region then, for example, the, the elevation, the topography of that region is much more uh, higher resolution, is better resolved, and then you can capture some of uh, uh, some physical uh, process that are not uh, represented on a coarse resolution. Of course, the technique is similar to the weather predictions, to the numerical weather prediction, is the same kind of technique, but for a different purpose, for a different uh, temporal scale. Up to now, by using uh, our models, this is just like an advertisement, <laughs> the model it's used in all this region of the world means that we were able to uh, train the, research, the researcher in all this region and there are groups that are using this model to, to do their climate, regional climate model research. Uh, and we, every a couple of years, come together or together in Trieste and we have this kind of workshop or if possible, if there is a strong partner like the um, Sao Paulo team, we can also come and do the same things abroad. So this is like the trend of the paper published using uh, our model. And then uh, all these are the training workshop up to a certain point. So there are also the most recent one, two weeks ago, there was a workshop in uh, Vietnam. Uh, okay, there was two years ago the workshop here um, and uh, many other that probably are missed in the list. So what do we have in our regional climate model system? So the dynamic uh, we add up to two years ago, so to the previous edition of the workshop, we only had the hydrostatic version of the model because we were not aiming to go to very high resolution like we are now. Uh, but now, so everything that is underlined is quite recent. We have the non-hydrostatic version, so we have a different core, so we have a double core in the model, and we also are able to get to high resolution, such high that we go convection permitting resolution. And tomorrow we'll, I will show you where we are and what we can do, what is reasonable to do. The radiation scheme, it's uh, the CCM3 scheme from Kiel is one of the most used scheme. And then there is a new one that is called the NNRD from so Fabian Solomon that was working with us until last year. The large scale precipitation was parameterized so far, was not, was represented so far by the SABEC scheme developed in the 2000. But now we have a new explicit microphysics, microphysics scheme that in the model it's known as Nogerotto Tompkins. It was developed uh, two years ago. You, uh, you find the reference paper, it's not that, it's I think it's Nogerotto 2017. And also, most recently, we also introduced uh, the microphysics scheme from WORF, the WSM5 microphysics. So it was taken from is the same parameterization as in WARF. And um, we, we sometimes exchange this kind of uh, scheme and parameterization among the regional model. 
In fact, if you look inside the wharf, the TIPK scheme, that is a convection scheme, it's taken by our model. So it's a kind of like we borrow each other the, uh, the um, physics scheme and the parameterization. So the cumulus convection, we have several cumul cumulus convection, the Graal, the Emmanuel, the MIT Emmanuel, and the SCUO, the mixed convection, so you can also switch one convection over the ocean, one over the land, and then mo most recently the TIPK convection, that is the same, tic the, the same scheme that, for example, the EC Earth model is using, the ECMWF model is using. Then, uh, as a uh, boundary layer scheme, we have two, the Olson and the UWPBL that was introduced more recently. For land surface, we have the very old BATS and sub-BATS, then we have the CLM most uh, recent version, the 4.5, that is the most updated one. Uh, the ocean fluxes are two, and they are quite old, but still okay. And the configuration can be added up to any region, so you can choose your own uh, configuration. What about the coupled system? So with what the atmosphere can be coupled so far? So we have a coupled version of the model that is coupled with both the MIT ocean model and the ROMS. Mm, and there are already paper published on it. We have an interactive lake model that is very important when you go to high resolution. So it's, uh, this is something you have to keep in mind because when you reach resolution that are around 25 kilometers, you start to see the effect of the lake. So you have not to forget that this lake model has to be used. Then we have the biosphere, interactive biosphere that is available in CLM. Interactive hydrology, so the land surface. So we have the hydrological model that finally is coupled both offline and online. So we are able to root, to run off the water. Then we have several aerosol scheme from the uh, all developed in ICTP from people that have been coming and leaving us, unfortunately. And then we have um, several gas phase chemistry that was also developed by the French-Egyptian team. So everything is there, and you are welcome to, to have a look and try during the workshop. So where we were two years ago, it was uh, we were running the model on all the region, on all the so these are the famous Kordak region that you will hear later, probably. And we were able to run our model together with the local scientists, so with the collaboration with the local scientists in all these uh, uh, red boxes in all these regions. So you see that South America was one of those. And we had many simulations in South America. You see in the table we have uh, five, six simulation, means transient simulation, climate scenario, 130 year simulation with different uh, a scenario and they are a viable year, right, Rosemary? They can look at the data during the workshop. But these are kind of old simulation, like they are 50 kilometer resolution. They were published and analyzed together with all our South American colleague. But it could be a good reference for somebody that wants to start to look in, in, the, in this issue. There is a, there are a lot of paper and a lot of reference. But now we have to move on, and uh, we have recent, the most recent development that will bring us to a more um, high resolution simulation and what we call the Cordex Atlas. So we are running now the model in the new version for what is called the Cordex Atlas. So there are a few groups over the world, and we are one of those that took the, let's say, the agree to run their model all over the Cordex region to, to provide a reference for the next IPCC report, the IR6. And we are one of those groups together with the Max Planck in Germany, the CCLM community, that is as well the European community. Um, the WORF community is not clear yet what they are doing, but we are doing this run. So let's see with our the recent development because this is what uh, it's more interesting for you. So the model is able to, at the moment, the new version that you are using, it's tested all over the, those domains. So you see that 
although they are not continuous, but they cover all over the globe except the, the Arctic and Antarctic region because there you need to have also a sea ice model developed and uh, we have like a very preliminary one and we never tested the model there. So for the European region, this is uh, the what is called the Eurocordex region, the central one. You see that there, as you can imagine, we have several simulation, also higher resolution. So for this region, a 12 kilometer simulation is already, an ensemble of 12 kilometer si uh, resolution simulation is ready. And this is the region, the, the red one in which we also tested the model in convection permitting. So we are running our model at three kilometer resolution convection permitting, doing some climate scenario also at this resolution. Uh, all in all the other domain, at the moment, the state of the art is 25 kilometers, so we are running 25 kilometers all over the globe. And I what I can say so far, we have new simulation that will be soon delivered on the ESGF over South America. So we have uh, three GCM, two scenario, and one era entering 25 kilometer ready to to be uploaded, it's finished already, and uh, we are doing some preliminary analysis, but it's there. Same is true for Central America, same kind, so three simulation with three GCM with two scenarios, so it means six simulation, transient, starting from 1975 to 2100. And the scenario we are running is the 8.5 and 2.6, the climate scenario we are running, because those one are the one that are kind of the target of the next uh, IPCC report. Then we are running also over Africa. The simulation are not done yet, but the same is true. This domain is also run. The China domain is also ready. The Southeast Asia, we just had a workshop over there and the simulation are starting also for them. And the Australasia, it's ready too. Just to give an idea how the model is, uh, this is what we call the Rexium Atlas. So we are contributing all the simulation to the Rex to the Atlas, the Cordex Atlas. So the the model is this is j just an example. It's the annual bias of the model. So what you can expect when you run a regional model, you can expect that there is some bias over there. So if you look at the annual bias of temperature and precipitation, it will never be white, but as long as you are between two, three degree of bias, then you can uh, be happy also because it depends on the quality. There is a big issue about the uncertainty of observation, even for temperature. And what about precipitation? Also this, we have some bias over there, dry, wet, it depends where you are. But again, the, I mean, the important thing is to be mm, able to understand how this bias is compared to the seasonal cycle, to the annual cycle of this particular region. So if this bias is reasonable, if the seasonal cycle is correct and if the annual cycle is correct, the extreme representation, so this is just an idea how we test the model, but you will learn more in depth. So if you have such a bias, doesn't mean that the model doesn't work because you have to test the model in many other statistical uh, analysis and see if all the other things are correctly reproduced. And I can tell you that it, it is true. The model, it's, uh, it's able to represent the climate in those region. So what is uh, most, th the most uh, of the question from in, in this kind of workshop, when we go and present that we have a new version, this 4.7, then all the other people that are used to use the version that was available before, then the question is, what is the difference? What is the difference is the question that you can cover like <laughs> million of answer because from one ver version to another one, it's always many things are changed. So when you want to keep using the same, uh, the same, uh, let's say configuration that you were using in the version before, sometimes this is not something uh, that is working, often not. So every time you have a new model version, you have to test your model over the region, try to re 
set the model to give you a reasonable climatology over the region during the present day. And then when you are ready with this new climate, with the correct climatology, then you can move onward. So for the old Rexiam user, what is change? I will just be fast in this. <laughs> so there are many, like the infrastructure was changed a little bit. So for example, something in the um, in the um, compilation has to be compliant with the most advanced uh, um, um, uh, compiler uh, release. Uh, we also change a little bit the interpolation because we want to have the fields that are more smooth. In the pre-processing, we had the interface developed for new GCM because we want to run this uh, Cordec Atlas, so we needed to have more GCM over there. And also we changed something in the land surface for the CLM 4.5 chemistry and aerosol nesting option is now there. The model, what inside the model? Well, there are many things, one that is maybe relevant for you, the change of the name of the variable to be compliant with the Cordex uh, requirement. So now some of the variable have the correct Cordex uh, name. Uh, we fix something about the tendency calculation in the cross and dot point. Uh, and then the um, aerosol input forcing uh, also was uh, uh, set. And for the non hydrostatic part, uh, because now you remember we have two core, we have implemented some Rayleigh dumping filter because now with the new hydrostatic, with the non hydrostatic version, you have a problem of vertical instability that you didn't have before. So we need a, a, a filter to be <laughs> implemented. And there are some many fix in the equation. We implemented MM5 shallow convection scheme because the non-hydrostatic core is inherited from MM5. So we have to like, uh, we took something from the MM5 but also change it. And there are something about the chemical tracer as well. So then we have uh, what about the hydrostatics? There were some change also in the hydrostatic model. For example, the sea ice model has been fixed. The new scheme is there. This uh, uh, large scale scheme I told before, the WORF scheme is there. Then we have other things in the, for example, in the PBL, uh, the CLM. So everything, it's a little bit changing. And uh, for the post-processing, the most inter interesting thing is that beside the uh, interpolation for grads, for the grads user, but now we have a script that is embedded in the model as a post-processing. And with this script that is called PyCordex, uh, because it's a Python script for <laughs> Cordex output, <laughs> it's just, uh, this script is quite powerful because it takes the original output, you can run this PyCordex processing together with the model. So while you are producing the original output, you can also decide to have the PyCordex output and all your variable will be um, ready for the, for the Cordex format. This is very important because when you do an exercise like that, you want, you want to, when you want to share the data among the community, you have to stick to a convention, and otherwise all the other people will not be able to use your data. And so we just move the model to be compliant to this request. So then something more <laughs> on the coupled side. So the, the model is now fully coupled with the ocean, with the hydrology, and with the land surface. So for the atmosphere, it's the model that we use is our XCM4. For the ocean, at ICTP, we support and we distributed the coupling with the MIT. It's also viable to couple with ROMs, but it's not distributed by us, but by somebody else. And then uh, we have the coupling with the hydrology with two different uh, uh, hydrological models. This is a very low resolution one, it's HD. And then our team model that finally is fully coupled. So it's able to take the output from the land surface and create your runoff. If you have any curiosity about this or the setting, there is a paper that is published together also with other uh, speaker in the room. So what is uh, the, the 
essential difference when you go from hydrostatic to non-hydrostatic. In the non-hydrostatic version of the model, you have equation that are solving the um, so equation for the to s for the horizontal momentum equation. They are solved for the horizontal. Then you have the temperature equation and the surface pressure. When you move to the non-hydrostatic, beside the horizontal momentum, you need also the vertical momentum equation. So you need to uh, compute the vertical motion, and this is it's something that it's impacting the stability of the model. So the non-hydrostatic model, the version of the model non-hydrostatic is much more unstable than the hydrostatic in the same condition. And then also for the pressure, you have to have different uh, uh, parameterization of the pressure. So if you go and look into the model, the two core are different, but they are kind of one the twin of the other, uh, one of the brother of the other. So it, it they are easy to navigate. So the if you go non-hydrostatic and if you want to reach very high resolution, what it was uh, the large scale scheme that is the sub -X scheme that was used so far with only three phase. So the large scale scheme, the sub -X that were used so far, it, w it, w it was allowing only three phase. So we had only the cloud liquid, the water vapor, and the rain, and not many and not anything else. But now, if you reach higher resolution, in particular convection permitting, the Microphysics scheme need to be a little bit more complex and eventually to reach to the five phase. So you need to account for water vapor, cloud ice, and you need to have all this process exchange between the hydrometer. Otherwise, you are not able to realistic represent the formation of clouds and the precipitation. So we have two. They are both a five uh, five class microphysics scheme. One is Nogarotto Tomping, the, the other one is the WSM5 from WORF. And um, you can test and choose and see what is the most appropriate for your region and for your, for your uh, problem. Then we are brave, in, we were brave enough, and since two years ago, because we wanted to. Um, to put together this one of this project that is called flagship pilot study that I think Silvina will also mention for you. There is also one in South America. But the first one that was approved and started was the one over Europe and was on convection permitting. Why? You will discover this tomorrow because I will give you a lecture on where we are, what is the state of the art of convection permitting and what we are doing in this uh, scale. But the most important thing is that if you look at a plot like this, the scale, the characteristic scale length and time scale, so far we have been working. So if you work with GCM, if you work in the GCM world, you are up here. So your scale are greater than 100 kilometer and your time scale are like from 10 minutes upward. If you go down to the RCM, the, the, let's say the standard RCM simulation, like this 25 kilometer simulation that we are running, you go to resolution greater than 12 kilometer because this is the highest we reach without going convection permitting. So you go a higher resolution in space and also higher resolution in time. But if you want to go convection permitting, you have to go lower than four kilometer because otherwise uh, your um, assumption is not ready. And then you have to resolve phenomena that are that are happening at a time scale that are lower, so faster than one minute. So you need to have the physics scheme like the five uh, mm, the five class uh, microphysics scheme are the only one that are able to do this job. So there is you know, a change of scale and time. But this will be continued tomorrow, so I will not give you many details today. As a purpose of this workshop, what we see as a purpose as a team from, uh, mm, from Brexium uh, ICTP, the idea is, uh, but I think this is in agreement with what is the expectation here in Sao Paulo, how to, to learn the, how to use the model if you don't know the model. So this will be able during the lab session. There will be like a training slowly, moving slowly from really the 
first step up to something more complex. If you are already a Raxium user, we can also try to work out uh, some answer to a research question that you would like to answer. And then Francesca will drive you on which are the, I mean, wh what is needed to answer your research question. So what do you want to look at? Do you want to look at the extreme um, climate of your, over your region, the climatology, added value, why should I go to the very high resolution? What should I, what do I, hope to get if I go to a resolution, how can I isolate this added value or stuff like that. Then the other point is get familiar with the Cordex uh, data because Rosemary put available some data. So if you start to work with this data, maybe you, it will be easier for you to use the next release of the Cordex uh, simulation. And then prepare a small presentation from your side so that Friday you can tell us uh, what you have learned and uh, if your expectation were fulfilled or if you have some recommendation from us. And I think I'm done with this. <laughs> if you have any question, curiosity or comment, you are welcome to ask. Everybody is too shy in the first talk, so maybe <laughs> it will come later. <laughs> yeah. If not, we will be here long all the week, so you can ask us anything whenever you want. Okay. Uh, now I, s I saw that uh, we start early in the <laughs> end. Yes, but uh, you can start uh, to. Uh, this way I'm, I'm, I make it uh, confusing in my mind uh, because uh, I think that uh, we need to start nine, nine. but the nine thirty. Nine thirty. Nine thirty. But it's okay. It's 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 now it's, it's, it's nine fifty-six. Nine. 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 Yes, because uh, we change the timing. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, we I have time. I will present the director of IAG, uh, one, Dr. Pedro Leite da Silva Dias. Well, I just like to welcome all of you for this uh, workshop, and this uh, it's going to be a pretty intensive week, as I can see from the program, and uh, I'm pretty happy to see that. Uh, um, this uh, more, let's say, global view of extreme events as a multi-scale and multi-physics problem. And the fact that um, the model is now able to cope with the, the uh, scale interaction in the sense that uh, with the non-hydrostatic version uh, provides a whole new uh, world from the point of view of uh, exploring uh, nonlinearities arising from the fact that you have uh, uh, very important uh, nonlinear processes that are driven by convection, and then you have uh, uh, very intense vertical motion. And the other point that uh, I think is very interesting is the fact that uh, the coupling with uh, other components of the climate si system, uh, including the ocean, the sea ice. Sea ice, as I can understand, I think it's still not quite uh, complete, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why you avoid the pools, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the fact that you have the interactive biosphere, the aerosols, and so on, things that uh, in the last uh, 15, 20 years became pretty much uh, clear that uh, they play a significant role in uh, promoting uh, extreme events. So extreme events is uh, pretty much like a, an aircraft uh, accident. I mean, it's not just one single cause, it's the combination of several. 
And if you don't have a model with a more complete physics, it's very difficult to clearly uh, detect what are the mechanisms responsible for uh, a, a particular uh, climatic event, extreme event. So I hope you enjoy this uh, week. Uh, we had an, ev uh, an example of an extreme event uh, on Saturday night. Some of you may have seen the fence here on our side. Uh, it was pretty windy. Uh, so it was uh, the right time. Yeah, so the right time to have a, uh, a meeting about extreme events. <laughs> I hope there's no no other <laughs> no 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 more extreme events during the week. <laughs> so uh, have fun and uh, enjoy uh, the course. Okay, thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Well, the next speaker is Silvina Salmo from. University of Buenos Aires, Conicetti. Uh, Half. Yes. If you like, you, you can climb. Hello. It's a mystery. Hello. Good morning to everybody. I am no. 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 Está? No está. Sí. So, good morning to everybody. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Rosemary, and thank you, the ICDP, for co-organizing this uh, meeting. Uh, actually, I have two presentations, but I will be short in both of those. Uh, and uh, given the, the strong uh, impact of Cordex in this, uh, in this meeting, I will start with the Cordex one, because I think it's interesting for most of the people who are not very aware of what Cordex is. And uh, because of the strong impact of, on Cortex and the, all the, the work with the REC PM uh, aiming to, to bring Cortex uh, uh, successful and uh, also because we are here too because of a flagship pilot study on extreme events over the southeastern South America, which is also a Cortex um, thing. So I will present Cortex now. So uh, what is Cortex? Uh, Codex is um, uh, yeah. uh, Codex means coordinated regional climate downscaling experiments. That's Codex. So to understand what Codex is about, I will briefly go through the history of, uh, of this uh, uh, program. Uh, what are the visions and goals of the project? what the data is available and can be uh, get from the Cordex database, and what are the future of Cordex. So Cordex is um, uh, started initially um, in, 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 in the, under the umbrella, in the umbrella of, the w, of the World Climate Research Program. Uh, who asked for a great, greater, greater coordination across downscaling activities that were ongoing within several regions of the world, mainly in Europe, but also in the Australia, in South America, in North America. But all these uh, downscaling activities, mainly through regional climate models, were 
uh, not coordinated among, among them. So the idea was to, to try to coordinate a little bit the, the work done uh, with the regional climate models. And in 2010, a task force on regional climate modeling was established to try to, to, to seek for this uh, coordination. Uh, the, he, the head of, uh, of that task force were Philip Georgi and Colin Jones. Uh, and uh, within that idea, uh, the first Pan Cortex conference was uh, uh, was uh, done in Trieste in 2011 with almost 180 participants. So it was a huge community working on regional climate modeling. Many of those were on um, with, with the RECCM because the, the conference was in Trieste. But the, 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 the big thing was that uh, the, the communities dealing with regional climate modeling were, were huge. So uh, after that, in 2012, the WCRP program uh, set up a science advisory team to, to steer CORDEX and to try to, to um, uh, develop uh, the strategies for coordinating the regional climate um, work. So in 2013, in Brussels, uh, we had the second Pan CORDEX conference with 400 participants. It was a very, very uh, large um, activity. Uh, and then as uh, seeing that the Cortex community was grow growing up and the Cortex um, um, products were, were really uh, doing the, 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 the right, going the right track, um, Cortex grew up to be a project within the WCRP umbrella. And in 2015, uh, a project office was established, uh, like GWIX, like other, other big, big um, uh, projects, uh, depending on the WCRP. And uh, last, the Stockholm conference in 2016, uh, where 500 participants uh, were there. I will. I, I, I will. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what, what, is going, what, what is CORDEX doing with all this uh, regional climate modeling stuff? So the idea of CORDEX was initially to link regional expertise on climate modeling. So uh, having a, uh, knowing that uh, there were many groups working on regional climate models, uh, the, uh, the main idea was to build upon prior experience with regional simulations and process study. Uh, so uh, the, the, the continental areas of the world were divided in 14 cortex regions. And this is more or less uh, drafted in these uh, four uh, sketches. So each of those displays one of the cortex continental regions. And uh, the, the one of the aim was not only looking at uh, how to coordinate the activities within the regional climate modeling community, but also with the statistical downscaling, downscaling community. So it's more than uh, modeling. It's just downscaling, which is broader than modeling. And the idea was, as I, I said before, cover all the major land masses in the Earth, including the Arctic and also the Antarctic regions. There are not displayed there. So the vision of CORDEX, why CORDEX was established, was because uh, the, um, there was a mandate to advance and coordinate the science and application of regional climate downscaling through global partnerships. There, there were different goals. Uh, one is to better understand the relevant regional and local climate phenomena. Uh, to evaluate and improve regional climate downscaling models and techniques, to produce coordinated sets of regional downscale projections worldwide, and to foster communication and knowledge exchange with users of regional climate information. And this is here because uh, at the time uh, there were many, many impact studies going on, and most 
uh, impact analysis were done based on global circulation models, which are coarse resolution and they don't have the, the, the information requ required for uh, impact analysis like, I don't know, uh, hydrological modeling, uh, crop yield modeling, or whatever. So the need of high resolution was also a request from the user community. And that was another leg that Cordex was trying to, to, to cope with. So the, there are a, a number of scientific challenges within the Cordex umbrella. Uh, up to now, we are still working on uh, try, uh, updating our scientific challenges. Up to, night, up to now, uh, we have identified six key challenges to help Cordex move forward. And these are listed in the gray uh, blocks there. Uh, the focus are on cities, just to evaluate <coughs> the effects of climate change, heat, heat islands, land use, land cover change over cities, which is also one of the main questions or challenges of uh, what is called the grand challenges of the WCRP uh, program. Uh, another challenge is, has to do with, with energy. Uh, inland waters, small island, organized converting systems, and that, that includes different kinds of uh, convective systems, and high mountain environments. All these uh, key challenges clearly reflect the need of high resolution. And uh, additionally, with these uh, scientific challenges, there are five cross-cutting topics or themes uh, in which um, Cordex should focus their activities. And these are added value, which is an uh, ongoing discussion uh, of uh, do, do regional climate models really add value upon the global circulation models providing the boundary conditions. This is a, a very historical discussion, but still uh, going on. The human factor means all this uh, impact analysis that makes use of the Cordex uh, data or information to produce uh, the impact studies. The convection permitting modeling, uh, Erika will, will talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, couple models, you, you have already also listened to Erika talking about what the, uh, the coupling um, uh, features are, are being more and more um, usual in, in the new generation of the regional climate models. And one big uh, cross-cutting topic of Cordex is the capacity building. And here we are, here we are in, in one of those. So to talk about a little bit about the um, Cordex history uh, during the phase one, which, was, which, which began in 2012, more or less, or before 2010, uh, it was established this Cordex protocol in which for all the continental areas of the world, uh, different groups uh, could be able to provide simulations in the two different frameworks. One was the evaluation fra framework, and the other was the climate projection framework. The evaluation fr framework is, um, uh, is uh, related with uh, which model is providing the lateral boundary conditions to the, to the regional model. And in that case, evaluation means that the lateral boundary conditions uh, have to be provided by the era interim reanalysis over the, that period, 1966 to 2005 at that time. Um, with the fixed uh, resolutions, so either uh, 0 0.44 um, degrees or 22 or 11 grid spacing. Uh, and the, the idea was that any group could uh, do, perform the simulations and uh, put available that simulations in the Earth System Great Federation system, uh, which is um, a, a sort of a virtual um, database. And the, the other, the Climate Projection Network, was 
uh, focus on climate projection. So in this case, the forcings were uh, given by different uh, Earth system models, uh, global Earth system models, or atmospheric uh, ocean couple uh, general circulation models for mainly for two uh, scenarios: RCP 4.5 and 4 and 8.5 for the whole period from 19. 1951 to 2100 uh, in a continuous run with a particular and a special focus on Africa for, for this first phase because Africa was the, con the continent for which less work than on with regional climate models were at that time, but now things have changed. So um, this was already co uh, com completed. So that there were many, many simulations for the different regions of the, of the cortex domain. Um, many simulations, most of the simulations were uh, at this uh, 50 kilometer resolution, but also other regions uh, could be able to, to perform simulation at 22 and 11 kilometers, like Europe, Europe and Med cortex region, the Mediterranean region. Um, all of these simulations were driven by semi 5 models, and um, most of them are already available in the Cordex data bank, the Earth Grid uh, generate, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ESHS. Um, sorry. <coughs> Move too fast. Oh, something is not working. The mic stuff. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, I need uh, the other part with this phase two. Uh, phase two, I, I will have to explain it because I cannot see it here. Phase two um, uh, was uh, the way forward. So we Cordex realized that the work done, the work was done. So. The coordination was uh, a, a success because uh, many, many modeling groups um, agreed on, on um, doing all the simulations in, un, under the umbrella of the CORDEX protocol. So the availability of simulations to, to try to see uncertainties and different uh, stuff on, on using these uh, simulations were huge, really a big number of of uh, information is available, available in the Cortex database. But that was not enough because uh, during the establishment of the process for the, semi for, for the um, uh, new IPCC assessment report, it was recognized that general circulation models were achieving higher and higher resolutions. So 50 kilometer resolutions was a little bit cost for regional climate modeling. So we need to go farther, to move faster. Uh, now global models are, high, there is a high res MIP uh, program project, which uh, uh, means that uh, atmospheric global circulation models are being intercompared at, I think it's 50 kilometers, something like that. So uh, we don't need regional climate models at 50 kilometers anymore. So uh, we, 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 we need to improve the resolution. And uh, one of the initial mandates of Cordex were to provide simulations at 25 and 11 kilometers. And now some groups are providing this uh, 25 kilometers. Um, one of these uh, is under the um, umbrella of what uh, Erika mentioned, the ATLAS. Uh, but in, in a more general sense, the ATLAS is part of what Cordex call the Cordex core, I will show you in, the mi in a minute. And the, the need for higher resolution also um, wa was also established uh, within Cordex in, in, the, in, the, in the form of these flagship pilot studies, which I will show you in, in a minute. And there is something else that I don't remember, but I can see it in the in the in the in the page. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so what the pilot flagship pilot studies are? Um, the idea was um, the following: if if we are going to 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 reach high resolution, it's quite difficult for some groups uh, not dealing with huge computing systems to 
attain a high resolution at such a big cortex domains because the, the cortex domain are very, very big. And the computer resources is uh, limited. It's a limit for, for many, many groups. So uh, in order to, to move forward to the higher uh, resolution up to the, clim to the convective permitting uh, climate simulations, um, the, the, the Cordex uh, scientific advisory team uh, agreed on these uh, flagship pilot studies, uh, which were, were again uh, coordinated developments at very high resolution, but for regions uh, much smaller than those uh, given by the Cordex domain, the big Cordex domain. So, the idea was to uh, establish a strong basis of these flagship pilot studies on fine scale processes requir requiring higher resolution, such to understand, for instance, the land sea breeze in any, any area of, uh, of the world, um, to have an ob observational basis for verifications, because if you, if you go to uh, with a, uh, a model simulation in three kilometers and you don't have data to verify the quality of that simulation, it's useless. So you, you need to, to, to show that you have uh, good information or good data to, to evaluate uh, your model. And also to understand that all these uh, downscaling um, uh, exercises are done with a purpose. We, are, we, we do not perform model simulations because we like to run models. But we also perform model simulations because there are groups that are willing to use our, our model outputs to do, uh, to continue working and, for instance, to evaluate the impact of uh, climate change on specific sectors, health, agriculture, hydrology, whatever. So there, there, we, we, we all the time have in mind these three important issues. And so, uh, under this uh, call, uh, also we, we intended that this um, flagship pilot studies has, should have a potential connection with other WCRP programs like GWIX, this uh, Global Earth uh, Water and Energy Exchange thing. And up to now, there were seven proposals endorsed by CORDEX within uh, six coordinate regions, and these are the, maybe I'm missing the last one here, but as you see, there are some uh, flagship pilot studies, uh, two, uh, three, of, three of them focus so all over the U European area. Uh, one of those is the one that uh, Erika mentioned, uh, with the convective phenomena at high resolution. Um, another focus on line exchanges, and here we have our flagship pilot study, extreme precipitation events in southeastern South America, a proposal for better understanding and modeling, and there are some a couple from Africa and the Mediterranean region. So this uh, Cordex flagship pilot study of South America, it's uh, led by Maria Laura here, she's here and a number of researchers from different countries, including Argentina, Brazil, Italy, the Czech Republic, Spain, and Uruguay. Uh, some of the participants of this uh, flagship pilot st study are within this room now. And the, well, again, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's supposed to be other stuff here, but it, it's not working. Uh, well, I don't know, Maria Laura, you are going to talk about a little bit more about the flagship pilot study? Okay. okay. So the idea is to try to, 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 to focus on extreme precipitation events over the southeastern South America area, La Plata Basin, usually known as La Plata Basin, because it's one of the regions of the world where, where extreme events are more ubiquitous, are more uh, frequent, and are more um, um, uh, extreme. And uh, these are uh, convection driven. So uh, one of the um, focus of, uh, of this flagship pilot study is uh, to perform a coordinated uh, approach 
uh, in using statistical downscaling techniques and convective permitting simulations. Every 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 uh, parts of this uh, <coughs> uh, modeling and statistics in a coordinated way to provide uh, the, a better understanding of the um, in, in the climatic sense of the response of climate change to the of the sorry of the how the, the, the these uh, extreme events may respond to climate change over the La Plata Basin area. More or less, <laughs> that, that, that's the, the point. The other um, ongoing activity within CORDEX is what I mentioned previously, the CORDEX core. Core means coordinated e output for regional evaluation, and that was established after the IPCC request uh, to for to um, uh, prepare this uh, atlas of regional climate uh, information <laughs> and um, uh, with a regional focus in more than one chapter of the IPCC assessment report, um, the CORDEX score uh, were, was agreed among uh, different institutions uh, in order to provide a set of downscaling for each region because up to now there, there were regions with more than 100 simulations and regions were, were, with through two or three simulations available. So the, the, the idea of evaluating uncertainty or to, to associated to climate change in different regions were very unfair, were, were very odd. So uh, in order to, to do a, an atlas and to try to cope with the problem of uncertainty in different continental regions of the world, but uh, the, the number of simulations available should be the same, or more or less the same. So the idea of this core, the score was to provide a minimum set of simulations to, to, to make a, a, a comparable um, analysis of uncertainties of regional climate change. So in this, uh, with this in mind, um, it, the, it was established to use at least three different GCNs for each of the regional climate models, uh, at least five regional climate models, uh, mass uh, plus statistical downscaling techniques, and uh, based on at least two different forcing scenarios at resolutions which could be 12 kilometers or 25 kilometers. So that is what we call the CORDEX core, which will be soon, I hope, available in the CORDEX database to, to everybody. Uh, here is the CORDEX web page, so you, you can enter, if you, if you haven't done that, that you, you can visit the CORDEX uh, page. There you will find uh, CORDEX uh, overview, the, the, the list of simulations, the calendar, the reports from flagship pilot studies, and so on. I, don't see the image in my presentation. Here is the latest update I found, I, I, I could um, gather, from the regional climate simulations available in the CORDEX database for the South American domain. So you see uh, in blue, red, or, or, or black, uh, means that the simulations are available at the node. Uh, other simulations are done but not available yet because uh, the groups haven't had the time to, to upload the information or the simulations, uh, the outputs to the, to the database. And others are on, ongoing in, in progress. So the, the, the number of uh, simulations using different, uh, on the top you have the different regional models and uh, the, the first column means the different global models, forcing models, for driving the, the regional climate model. So there is an interesting number of simulations. Most of them, as you see, are on 50 kilometers. Just one simulation has already been provided at 20 kilometers, which is the, the one made in CEPETEC here in Brazil with the ETA model. Uh, but well, the community is, uh, is uh, growing. And uh, the last thing I want to mention is next year, uh, CORDEX is organizing the uh, third PAN conference, International CORDEX Regional Climate CORDEX conference, 
in 2019, which will be held in China, in Beijing. Uh, the, the call for abstract is not already open, but if you want to know more about this, you can visit this uh, web page to be aware of the date and all that stuff. Okay. So this is all for the Cortex uh, site. Now, I, any question about Cortex? Uh, at least uh, the Cortex core, the plans was to use some models, some big groups that we can run the models. All the continents. How, how many do you know? Uh, at least is uh, Rexiem. At the moment three are running. Uh, SMHI? SMHI is not. They are not? No. Okay. But Remo. Rexiem, Remo and CCLM. CCLM. No, uh, the, the Cosmo the model, model, isn't it? Cosmo yeah. Model. So. Okay. But be, because the, the, the main constraint was that the, the data had to be available on time for the report, for the assessment report, for the IPCC assessment report, for the atlas. Mm -hmm. And the atlas is already drafted, so the yes. simulation, yeah. But so. And the paper on the simulation should be submitted by December 2019. Okay. So we have one year. One. One okay, but the simulation should be finished yeah. in two months. Yeah, we will yeah. finish in January. Yeah. And Remo as well is mm -hmm. on the track, and Cynthia as well. Yeah. So, and besides that, a minimum number of simulations, other groups may also provide more, but maybe not in the in the uh, fulfilling the deadline okay. yeah so yeah marcelo uh, so uh, you mentioned one of the grand challenges is about cities yeah what are you planning to address about cities i mean the resolution is really i'm not sure what what are the questions regarding cities that you can uh, well it's it's a uh, there is a number of questions regarding cities but uh, I, I cannot tell you now no, yeah. it's because it's not the, there have not been so many uh, groups working on simulations at high resolution, including uh, any any study on cities yet. Usually, what yeah. you can see already at twenty five kilometers, if you use the urban model within a regional model, you see some signal coming from mm -hmm. the from the urban okay. uh, pipe. The big city, and after what you expect is to see the, for example, you have a, a flood that is due to the, the because there there is a city and not because there is a grass, and you can see this uh, by using the urban model and, and there would be the change how much water is not absorbed by the subsurface. So this is a urban model within the regional model. So but for example, within Rexian, in the in the CLM 4.5, you can use the urban model, and you can run with the urban model on. And this is what we actually do for 25 kilometers because the urban categories have to be you, you resolve the urban grid point there. And what was you, you you had something on Sao yes, Paulo city? I, I I, yeah, some yeah, some I remember that. Yeah. Design. Yeah. Uh, you present something about um, dynamic uh, the generation of information over the mountains. So it's into this modeling, uh, original modeling, exists any cryospheric uh, mechanism included into the... the uh, it depends on the model. Uh, it, it depends on how the model deals with the cryosphere. 
maybe Rexiem, you, you can talk about Rexiem. Yes, for example, in Rexiem, there is the, so we can simulate the marketing accumulation of the snow and the marketing, but we do not add the glacier more than mm -hmm. So for having the glacier, Evolution, you need to couple the glacial water inside. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. This is just prescribed. We know that in those grid points, there is a glacier. And the land use information you incorporate, you include some. If, if, you have, if you know that you have a glacier, then the, the land surface will parameterize the fluxes mm -hmm. according to the glacier. Mm -hmm. like if there is a glacier, your fluxes are different if you have a, a, a forest. Do, do you have any? Any research about that, or any about glacier? Yeah. Not really. No. Okay. No, but people working with glaciers, they they just uh, use the model outputs and provide the boundaries to the glacier models in offline set mode. Like an impact model. So they yeah. Get the data yeah. Yeah. Offline. Yeah. So, any other question? Okay, uh, I will go briefly to this second one. Can, do I have time? 50 minutes? No? Yeah, we, 15 minutes. Uh, the cortex is here. Okay, so the, my presentation is in this workshop. Actually, it was this. <laughs> But cortex has to be here, so that's why I, I, I decided to do both. So the, the idea is always, uh, what do we win when using regional climate models? And the way in which we can uh, um, uh, pose the question is this uh, stuff of added value of regional models. So the idea is, why are you, are you doing this work? Uh, at which scale are we expecting that uh, regional climate models really are use useful? So for, for doing this, uh, I will show some uh, results that uh, recently produced with a colleague, Josefina Blasquez. Uh, oh, again, sorry, I don't know what happened, but I can see what's... Can you see on the screen? No, I don't see any anywhere. So I have to... <laughs> Imagine well, the motivation is just like, like, like what I say, to, to, to answer this question. Uh, at which scales are we really expecting that the regional climate models uh, add value uh, compared with the driving global models? Because you know that uh, the regional climate is, um, is a, a mixture of uh, large-scale forcings plus regional and local-scale forcings. So, uh, Region, global models provide the global forcings that they do that, the teleconnections, the remote, remote uh, forcings to, 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 to make up, to build the, the regional climate. But uh, regional climate also depends on surface hetero heterogeneities like uh, topography, land sea contrast, land, inland water, um, land, land use. So there, there are a number of uh, uh, details on the surface that provides specific forcing to the regional climate. And if you are dealing with models and your models are low resolution, these forcings are not going to be captured. And so you are not going to capture the, the interaction between the large scale circulation and the, the regional forcing. So one of the motivations of using these regional climate models is because we understand that we are going to capture the regional forces. But again, uh, it depends on which scales we are talking about, uh, to what extent the, the, the climate features are more dominated by the long, uh, uh, the larger scale, or are more dominated by the uh, more details, more, more smaller scale. So in that, in that, with that in mind, we decided to to evaluate uh, this, this question, uh, at which scales are we really uh, added value with the regional climate models? So we use a set of uh, simulations, cortex simulations. Um, all the cortex simulations for the South American area are on 50 kilometers, which is a rather uh, coarse uh, resolution. 
and we just used uh, precipitation data and evaluated different behavior. Uh, it's very difficult <laughs> to follow like this. Uh, we evaluated different behavior of precipitation variability at different time temporal scales. So the idea was to uh, identify the variability of precipitation or the behavior of precipitation on different temporal scales from the, the mean, the seasonal means, the interannual, the intraseasonal, the synoptic, the synoptic scale, um, some um, statistics of the daily precipitation and the extreme events. So we try to to sweep through uh, a huge, uh, a big number of uh, uh, temporal uh, scales of precipitation behavior to see where, where, at which scale the, the regional models start doing something better than the, the global models. And we did it for two seasons, extended seasons, winter, extending winter and extending summer seasons. And um, this is just a, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to, to show all the, all the, the results, but just uh, uh, some example, examples to, to think about this, this quest of added value. So here you have the seasonal mean precipitation bias. In the top line, file, uh, line here are the regional climate models bias. The first one is the, 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 the seasonal mean from CPC uh, unified uh, precipitation data set. And the rest are the, the regional climate models. And in the bottom line, is uh, you, you can find the corresponding global model, the driving global model. So you see that uh, when, you, when you look at the biases, you have, yeah. Uh, for instance, this is the driving model of the WARF uh, climate, uh, model, regional climate model. So you see that for some models, the, the bias are reduced. Bias are in these units, millimeter per day, per day. So uh, for some models, the bias are reduced, but for some other models, for instance, this and this, this is the global, and this is the regional model, and this is not evident that the, model, the regional model is doing a better job. And the same happens if you look at the, uh, at the extended summer season. So unfortunately, I can't show you the, the, the right, um, well, OK. Uh, so uh, the, the point was that uh, at that stage, uh, it wasn't evident that the seasonal mean precipitation was better or, or was uh, not better from the regional models compared with the global models. It depends on, as I said before, the, the impact of the regional forces. So going to variability patterns, uh, this uh, shows the first empirical um, orthogonal function, the EOF, of the precipitation anomalies for the interannual variability in the in the right side during the um, summer, the extended summer, and the left side is the first empirical orthogonal function of the precipitation anomalies at the intraseasonal variability, which is the variability filter between 10 and 90 days. So again, in the upper rows, you have the observations and regional models, and the lower rods, the, the global models. And you see that uh, the, the internal variability is um, forced by mostly during the summer time by El Nino in the South Hemisphere. So it's really a remote uh, forcing and the large scale forcing. So we expect that the um, response given by the GCM will be uh, inherited to the regional climate model, so they, they won't change a lot. And indeed, you see that uh, the, the signal in the interannual variability scale is really um, controlled by the signal given by the global model driving the regional model. For instance, this is the, the global model driving this, and this is the global model driving this and this. And you see that these are pretty much similar to this one because it is expected that the global model uh, provides the, the, the main force in, uh, the, at these scales. If we go to the intraseasonal variability, again, uh, if uh, the intraseasonal variability is uh, during the summertime is uh, characterized by, the, by this well known CISO pattern in South America, the, the, the opposite anomalies 
in the precipitation field between the South Atlantic Convergence Zone region and the La Plata Basin region. This is a very, very well known feature. And again, all the global models are able of capturing this uh, pattern and the, the regional models do the, 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 the good job also. But again, the intrasystem variability are still patterns dealing with circulation, regional scale circulation, but we expect that global models at roughly 100 kilometers can do well because th at these scales, the, um, the, the forcings of the intrasystem variability, which are related with anomalous circulations at synoptic scales are well reproduced by the global models, so, so they, they will all also be well reproduced at the with the regional models. Uh, this is a summary of, um, of the skills of uh, regional and climate models in uh, reproducing the interannual, the intraseasonal, and the synoptic scale variability, which was defined between four and ten days. Ahora no sé qué pasa. Time for coffee. Time for coffee. Se apagó. Mm. Yo no toqué nada. <risa> Yo solo toqué esto. Mm. Se apagó aquello, la, la lámpara. ¿Dónde está el chico? Só desligue? Você cortou? So, okay. So, uh, at these uh, different scales of variability, and here, uh, these are different metrics for model evaluation. Uh, one of the metric R here is the um, spatial correlation coefficient between one field, the, the model field, and the observed field. And this is very simple, and as you see, uh, if you compare, for instance, the, um, the spatial correlation between the standard deviation of the interannual variability for winter time uh, of the global model against observations and the regional models against observations, you don't see that the regional model improves. And that was expected because the interannual variability is a large scale driving uh, uh, feature of the precipitation um, uh, behavior. So uh, it, it was expected. The other, the other measure of uh, model evaluation here is what uh, it was explained in one of the, of the slides, is the M score. The M score is a sort of skill score that compares um, uh, the mean square error uh, spatial mean square error between model and the CPC uh, unified observation data set. It, uh, it, it, it is a score, so it's un unitless, but the, the, what I'm showing here is the, the, the rate between the score of the regional model and the score of the global model. So as much as the score is larger, the, the model performs better. So is the, is the rate of this score is larger than one, means that the, the regional model is better in capturing the, 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 the feature, whatever it is the feature, uh, compared with the driving model. And you see here that uh, there are some, uh, not, not always the information given, but this uh, uh, coefficient, this metric is in the same sense as the, the information given by this rate because 
some this this also captures some information concerning the um, the bias uh, different in the in the mean values in the spatial mean values so uh in order to to rise up a clear message of which model is performing better the regional or the global we have to to have a look to to, to the two uh, metrics the this correlation and and this rate but i'm not going to go to go through all these uh, these and these things but um if you if you see for instance the let's focus on on this uh, on these rates uh the this uh, wharf model uh is always has always a, a higher score compared with its driving model and that is not clear maybe with this uh, RCA4 for, for winter and uh, it's not really clear for all the for, for all the, the scales and for the the two the two periods if we go into the streams uh, here in the, we we can see an example of uh, the daily precipitation empirical Distribu distribution of uh, those, those target areas, the La Plata Basin and the South Atlantic Conversion Zone area. And here you, you can see <laughs> in black is the observations and the, the continuous lines are from the regional models and the, the discontinuous lines are for the global models. So you see that, the, that there are two regional models that are closer to the uh, distribution of the daily precipitation given by the observations compared with the driving models the colors means that uh, the same global and uh, driving the, um, the 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 regional model so you see for instance that this violet here uh, is the um, remo mpi and it's the the driving model is the mpi here and you clearly see that the as as long as you go to the higher precipitation the, the the match between model and observation is better and it's better I, I guess uh, for, for all the for all the, the distribution of the precipitation and this also happens uh, with the in this uh, other region and you see here that there are two models the re, the, these uh, two versions these two the regional climate models from the SMHI the RCA model are really doing a very very poor work in La Plata Basin, but they are not at bad, at bad in the in the Sachs region. But it, it's more or less clear that when you go to the daily statistics, the regional models start providing better information compared with the regional, with the global models. In the, if you are looking to ex, extreme precipitation, which is um, the 95 percentile of the daily precipitation compute for the uh, warm season, and here you have uh, the observations and regional models and global models, and you see you here see a clear difference between how the regional and global models reproduce the extreme precipitation. Um, unfortunately, I can have uh, some uh, pop-ups in the presentation with some summaries of, of, of all the of all the issues I, I mentioning so I, I will go straight to the to the final um, uh, conclusions or uh, uh, messages uh, even if uh, if there are some improvements uh, particularly for extreme events uh, with this uh, set of regional climate models which are operating at more or less 50 kilometers resolution. This resolution is still very low if we are going to deal with extremes that in, in every region of the world, but particularly in this uh, area during the summertime, in, in the southern part of South America, the south, including uh, the South Atlantic Conversion Zone and the um, La Plata Basin, uh, convec convection is the paramount uh, feature and process driving these convec convective uh, storms. And definitely this uh, resolution is not able to deal with convection, but with param through the parametrization. So uh, even if we are looking at, if we are uh, um, 
finding some improvements in the regional climate models compared with the global models, we have to, to be aware that uh, we are not reaching the, 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 the resolution that uh, really uh, uh, secures us that the improvement, improvement is, um, is really um, uh, always, always there. Because as you see, it depends on where you look at, uh, if the model has a strong bias, um, it, you don't see much improvement. So the, it's important to understand that the models are not perfect, that these uh, simulations are really coarse resolutions, um, that this num the, the, the ensemble size evaluated is very, very uh, small, just four models. And um, the other point that we have to, to recognize is that uh, re reliable data sets for high quality information should be also available to, to, to make a better evaluation of this kind of, 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 of features, of the precipitation features like ext extreme events. So um, maybe uh, these uh, results um, just justifies the need of uh, more focused studies on convective permitting uh, scales for dealing with the particular regional phenomena. So I'm finished here, so coffee may be ready. Thank you for your attention. Me iba con el micrófono. Me van a escuchar. Just one. Hola. Okay. Yeah. This is the, the better is the PDF. It's PDF, yes. Because and I wanted to, how do you put this one? Um, okay. Oh, no, I, no. This one. I think that just, okay. Okay, I want to, that's okay.
cierto. lo que preferí sí por ahí está porque voy a eh, usar el well now everybody is full <laughs> Uh, the next speaker is Maria Laura Bertoli. She can present. She. Okay. Ah, that's the, the last one. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, all of you, for being here. And also, I want to thank uh, Rosemary and also the ICTP and Erica for uh, this workshop. Um, well, my name is Maria Laura Betoli. I'm from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. And the title of my talk is Statistical Downscaling in La Plata Basin. Uh, but uh, my talk uh, will focus on these three topics. Uh, uh, they are different, but they are related, as you will see. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk is about CORDEX, Empirical Statistical Downscaling. CORDEX ESD is the uh, ESD initiative of the CORDEX program. Also, I will talk a little bit about the ESD in La Plata Basin and the, the ongoing studies there. And, uh, and also a few words about the Cortex flagship pilot in South America that Silvina already mentioned. Um, OK. Well, first, uh, Cortex and Cortex ESD. As uh, Silvina mentioned before, Cordex is a well-established program uh, of the WCRP that was launched in uh, 2009. Uh, the RCM community is very, very well organized uh, via uh, Cordex and also other initiatives. Uh, however, for different reasons, the uh, ESD community is not well organized and uh, lacks from uh, coordination. Uh, it is recognized that the ESD community, uh, ESD community has to organize itself and progress toward a framework compatible with the Cordic, Cordex RCM uh, development. The ESD methods are recognized as of equivalent skill with different advantages, uh, some of special relevance for the impact community, and also with different shortcomings compared with the RCM. The ESD potential has not been uh, explored as substantially or as systematically as uh, the RCM, as you know, uh, and there is a gap in all the assessment for the application uh, of downscaling by the impact and adaptation communities. So considering all of this, the Cortex ESD initiative was launched in 2013. We uh, have um, three uh, workshops that uh, 
uh, were organized with a broad participation from the international ESG community. Uh, the first one was in Trieste in 2013. The second one was in Buenos Aires in 2014, and the third one in Cape Town in 2015. Uh, these workshops uh, helped to stimulate and coordinate the initial discussions uh, regarding the core ESE organizations and activity. Uh, as a result of these um, workshops, uh, we have um, a reference document where the, um, the, the mission, the objectives, the organization, and the plans of the Cortex ESG initiatives uh, are uh, summarized there. I'm not going through this document or, or these uh, things, but well, uh, you can find the, the document in the Cortex uh, webpage. And you can read it, and um, well, we can discuss it if you want later. Uh, but well, the Cortex CSD mission is to guide and coordinate the development and validation and use of statistical uh, downscaling method methods, and also to contribute to the generation and interpretation of region-specific climate change projections. Um, well. One of the uh, first activities that we planned in, the, uh, in Cortex ESC was a coordinated experiment uh, because we want to encourage the collaboration and the coordination of the different uh, uh, ESC groups around the world. And well, this first experiment was performed in La Plata Basin. Uh, we chose this region uh, due to, for many reasons, but uh, um, because these two main reasons, the availability, availability of suitable observed records that are very important for the uh, statistical downscaling, and uh, we use the, the database provided by the CLARIS LPV initiative that uh, um, was very important for, for this region, collecting the data, the observed data in this region. And also the other, re the other reason was that there are a few studies, ESD studies, in the region. Um, just to show you an example, if we uh, do a search in Scopus, looking for uh, papers, uh, using the statistical downscaling and South America uh, words in the, in the, uh, the searching machine, uh, in the title, abstract, and keywords, we found uh, 22 documents, uh, 22 papers about ESD in South America. Uh, this, is the, this is the progression in time, and uh, I want to uh, um, highlight here that in La Plata Basin, because I, I search in South America, in La Plata Basin, uh, these two uh, papers, the first one in the, in the time series was uh, from Salman and Nunez uh, using um, uh, the multi-progression methodology in La Plata Basin. And another one from Donofrio that uses a um, neural net network uh, in, in La Plata Basin too. Uh, I will show you some results um, um, from uh, more, more recent results and ongoing studies on ESE, but I wanted to mention that these two uh, uh, papers were the, the first one in the region. Another example of the ESD studies in, in the world is uh, this figure. We have here, um, just it's, it's, a, it's an example. Uh, these are the geographical locations, a number of studies where uh, the analog method, uh, that is an ESD method that we are going to learn on Thursday in the ESD training, Thursday afternoon. 
uh, well, uh, here we have uh, the number of studies um, where this method was used for downscaling purposes. And as you can see, um, Africa has just one. Uh, South America has, has just, just through uh, two or three. Uh, but well, Europe has a lot of studies and also um, uh, the United States. Uh, Australia also has a lot of studies using this, uh, this method. So, well, these are the reasons why this, uh, uh, for the Cortex ESD experiment, we chose a South American region uh, to perform this uh, coordinated experiment. Uh, these are some results from these experiments. Uh, different groups participated in the experiments. These are the results from the different groups. Uh, here we can see the, the bias of monthly rainfall in La Plata Basin. Um, well, the important um, uh, uh, result here uh, is, well, the coordinated action. It's just a, that's a very nice result. And also, well, that the, uh, the method performed differently, all the methods performed differently, and not only uh, among them, between them, but also uh, in the, they have different spatial uh, performances, okay? Uh, the same happened with, uh, with temperature. This is for maximum temperature, but it's not that uh, bad as uh, in precipitation. Uh, and uh, this one uh, is for minimum temperature. So uh, this result, uh, results encourage us to continue improving our method, that is this one in the corner here. This is uh, the method that we work at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, well, we have to improve this method, and we started to do that. Uh, this is, this um, are the simulations. This, these are different simulations using that method, the analog method, uh, using different uh, configurations or we call uh, predictor selections, different predictor sets uh, uh, for the ESC. We use uh, different, a lot of them, and uh, we evaluated the, for example, here, the root mean square error. And well, as you can see, they have uh, different performances, but depending on the local predictor, the season of the year, the seasons are the different colors in the figure. Uh, depending on the local predictor and the season of the year, different predictor sets may be more appropriate. For instance, here, uh, here we have, uh, for maximum temperature, uh, high errors, but for minimum temperature, the errors are, lo are lower with the same set of predictors. And for uh, precipitation, the, the errors are always uh, higher. Um, what do you mean just millimeters for millimeters? Mm -hmm. millimeters. By day? By day. Daily. It's daily. It's daily RCM, uh, uh, root mean square error. Yes, it's daily. Yes, are millimeter and it's daily. Uh, well, but well, we we chose uh, this set of predictors that is here with P6, but it's uh, sea, le sea level pressure, um, temperature, and uh, specific humidity at 850, and we analyzed that run because we we chose. We, we think that it, it was uh, the, the best one. Uh, and well, here we have the extreme percentiles. This is the uh, summer uh, maximum temperature percentile, the 95 percentile in summer, so it's uh, the highest uh, in the year. And this is the minimum, it's the winter my minimum temperature 5 percentile, so they are the extreme percentile, percentiles in the year. And well, here is the, the observed values, are the observed values, here are the simulated values, and the differences are here. Uh, well, the method performs very well. 
Um, the, the, as you can see here, there are some, some values with uh, one degree uh, in the percentile, but just some, some ones. The others are in the range of two, uh, 0.5 degrees. Uh, this is for minimum temperature, but for maximum temperature, the performance is good, except in these regions wh where we have some orographic features there that uh, the method cannot capture very well. Uh, okay, this is another example. This is another methodology we are working on. Uh, this is uh, an ESD methodology based on stepwise multilinear regression. Uh, we perform this uh, ESE study uh, in these three uh, stations in La Plata Basin, in the south of the La Plata Basin, and uh, we compare the, um, the raw GCMs and the, um, the GCMs with uh, uh, the downscaled, uh, the downscaled uh, simulations uh, fitted with these uh, uh, GCMs. The raw GCMs are uh, the raw data. Sorry, are, are from the uh, near uh, closest grid point to these stations. And uh, well, we can see here that the uh, the raw data is not that good, representing uh, this is sorry the summer uh, minimum temperature, the daily always daily summer uh, minimum temperature. Uh, 95 percentile. So, well, we can see that the, the method adds value to the uh, GCMs, except for uh, this uh, model that, uh, as we can see later, this one, this is the same, but for maximum temperature, the ESC performs well, but not that well as in the case of minimum temperature. But here, this model has problems. This, um, we, we check the GCMs also, and this model uh, that, that feeds the GCM is not, is not good uh, representing the circulation. Uh, that's why the, the, the ESD works uh, not that good there. But well, in temperature, we have some problems here and here in the other models. And this is the, sorry, the, the ensemble mean. Okay. Uh, another example. Uh, this is, again, uh, now, now I turn to the analog method, but um, this is for uh, precipitation, the 75 percentile in precipitation. It's not a highest percentile, but it is a, a, um, an important precipitation, the, the 75 percentile in the region, particularly for the uh, agricultural sector. This value is very important. So we analyze uh, this, um, uh, this characteristic. Well, the same, we are in this region, and uh, we have the raw uh, GCM data, and uh, this is the observed values, the, this is the, the distribution, uh, the spatial distribution of the observed values in that region. And we can see that the, uh, the ESD uh, improves the, the, the simulations, except for, again, this model that uh, we check. Again, this model, and we check all the models, but this model, uh, call, um, it, um, it's very, it has problems, <laughs> yes, has problems. So, um, well, the, the, ESD, the ESD method uh, can represent the values, as we can see here, but also uh, if we look at the, the spatial distribution of the percentile, um, we can see that the spatial distribution is a, mm, Better represented with the with the um, with the ESD. Uh, I forgot to tell you that we analyze uh, autumn 
uh, we analyzed the, the complete uh, year, but well, I, here I bring you the all from results and also the uh, spring results because in the region uh, the precipitation, the annual precipitation is uh, bimodal, has two maximums, one in, in the autumn and the other one in, in spring. So this is a very good result uh, uh, of this method. But in spring, the results are not that good. Uh, for example, here the values are not well captured by the, by the methodology, uh, but uh, the spatial distribution and the gradients are, are represented uh, very well. So we have to, to work on that hard. <laughs> so another example that we, I, I, I bring you here is the uh, joint occurrence of daily extreme precipitation and temperature. This is uh, these are, for instance, this part of the, of the presentation is uh, the, the, uh, they are observations of the uh, conditional probability of having a day with precipitation exceeding the 75 percentile, uh, given that the temperature, the minimum temperature in that day exceeded the 90 percentile. So they are joined. Uh, or compound events. So this is, these are the probabilities in the La Plata Basin observed. And these are, uh, we analyze this for um, an ensemble of RCM. And well, we can see here that the, um, the uh, RCM has some difficulties in representing the compound events and their probabilities. Uh, we, we did the, the same analysis with the analog method, but you have to take into account that this region is smaller than this one, it's this part, only this part. And, um, well, the ESD can, uh, can capture the intensity of the relationship and also the spatial distribution of these joint uh, extreme events. Uh, but we have here, here we have another example with comparison with the RCMs in, in, in the region. This is another case. It's a, a heat wave in 2003, in the summer of 2003. Uh, it was a very, very uh, important uh, heat wave that has a, a, a large impact in the um, uh, in the electric uh, power and in the health, uh, um, in the health sector, uh, it was a, a very very uh, important heat wave. And well, we 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 performed uh, simulations with the with an RCM, the WARP RCM for that um, a heat wave, and also we performed. These are the 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 four um, uh, uh, RCM runs, and we have here three uh, ESD runs, runs, sorry. And uh, well, we performed, we simulated the whole summer that are, were uh, 90 days. Here you can see the Taylor diagram of uh, that summer. And as you can see here, well, they are, they, they perform Similarly, all the methods performed similarly along the, the complete summer. But if we uh, focus on the nine days of the, of the heat wave here, uh, uh, this is the same analysis, the spatial, the, the Taylor diagram is a, um, it's a diagram comparing the spatial and temporal distribution or evolution of the heat wave that it, I don't know if, if you can see it here, but these are the spatial and temporal the, uh, evolution of the heat wave. This, uh, uh, this is the observations. These are the simulations, the, the seven simulations. And you have here the dates of the, the nine days of the, the heat wave and the stations uh, in order by latitude. So 
the, we can see here the, um, the distribution, the spatial and temporal distribution of the heat wave. And here we can see the, the three uh, last simulations are uh, from the ESD method, that the ESD, ESD method uh, overestimate the maximum temperature, sorry, this is the maximum temperature, uh, the daily maximum temperature. The uh, ESD method overestimates the, the temperature, and if we compare uh, the simulations in a Taylor diagram, the RCMs perform, the RCM perform better than the uh, analog method. This, this, uh, this three color are the analog methods. So, well, we are uh, working um, on all these things. We are uh, enthusiastic and we want to do a lot of things. Um, well, uh, the RCMs and ESD simulations suggest that both approaches show comparable skill depending on what aspect of the variable we are looking at. Uh, uh, to represent regional climate characteristics in La Plata Basin, adding value to the GCMs. Uh, they also show different advantages and disadvantages, uh, so they are considered a complementary approach and we have to explore and recognize all uh, disadvantages and disadvantages in order to uh, get an optimum complementary approach. And also, well, this encourages us to continue exploring, exploring the downscaling potential over the southeastern South America. In southeastern South America, is, uh, La Plata Basin is in southeastern South America. So, um, uh, uh, these studies and also the, um, the, the, um, the, uh, uh, the CORDEX ESD experiment uh, encourage us to present this CORDEX flagship pilot that uh, Silvina already uh, uh, talked about. And well, we presented our uh, um, flagship pilot in South America. Uh, uh, and the motivations to present this uh, flagship pilot that I realized here that I didn't put the title of the flagship pilot, but you know that it's about extreme events, uh, precipitation events, and uh, modeling and uh, to study interactions. Sorry for, <laughs> for forgetting the title here. And well, uh, the motivations were to um, that uh, extreme precipitation events over South America, southeastern South America, are becoming more frequent and more intense. And these events have very large uh, socioeconomic and um, hydrological impact. There is a need for better understanding and modeling of these precipitation events. And in this uh, aspect, the convection permitting uh, is considered and is uh, it, it will be explored. Um, there are a limited ESD studies in the region, as I already showed, and there is a need for developing RCMs and ESD coordinated actions. So these were the motivations for us. A group of us is here, us is the, the, the partners of the flagship pilot. Uh, to present this flagship pilot to CORDEX that was approved uh, in 2016, where the main objectives were uh, to, or are to study multi-scale processes and interactions, convection, local, regional, and remote processes, as already uh, Silvina showed, uh, and um, that result in these extreme uh, precipitation events. And also to develop actionable climate information from multi multiple sources that are statistical and dynamical uh, downscaling products uh, working with the impact community. Uh, that we are, we are going to have some presentations of, of from the impact community also in this workshop. The partners, as Silvina already mentioned, I, I'm not going through them, but we, we, we are uh, 
from South America, uh, there are partners from Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, and also from Europe, uh, the Czech Republic, Republic uh, from Spain, from Italy, uh, and well, we are working and trying to, to, to go forward. Uh, well, this workshop, uh, this workshop uh, was uh, proposed in the, in, the in the framework of this flagship pilot. Um, so I wanted to thank, uh, thank uh, the ICTP for welcoming us to, to propose this activity and, and, and for supporting this workshop in, uh, uh, in coordination with the RCM, especially with the REXCM uh, training sessions. Uh, so, well, enjoy the workshop. Question? Okay. This one or this one? Yeah, what's the, the optimum? What's the, the best correlation? This is uh, the reference point. This is the observation. The Taylor di diagram uh, um, uh, has three scores. One is the correlation that is in this uh, axis. Okay. And the other one uh, is the standard deviation, okay, we, we, for example, this is the standard deviation of the observed um, field, yes, so for instance, uh, uh, this, this run, the control run, has a similar standard deviation of the observed field, but it has a, a correlation of 0.6 with the uh, observed file. Um, almost, well, a little bit, okay. And what else? Uh, we have this, this axis that um, uh, shows the um, root mean square error, okay? The, the uh, standard, the standard. Okay, the standardized root mean. Okay, yes. So, do you understand? Well, well if this uh, cloud of points is near this point, the, the performance is very, very well. That's uh, the idea. So, that's why the control is so... Yes. The control is, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, about this simulation, uh, this is a... Uh, a climate simulation or a event simulation? This and what the was the resolution? For the summer, 50 kilometers is, I don't know, uh, <laughs> Rosia is here. <laughs> 50 kilometers. But yes. For one season? Only, uh, only the summer of 2003. Okay. Yes, it's just one event. We want to run different uh, heat events, uh, heat wave events, yes. Okay. This is one. Just one theoretical question, because I am not in ESD. But when you do this kind of mm, exercise, no, to my understanding, each ESD need a training data set that is different from the validation one, right? Yes. Otherwise, you would win anyway. So if you do something no, like... No, we didn't win here. <laughs> no, no, in general. But this is a good example, because it's nine, nine days. So in this kind of events, if you have a nine-day event, where do you train your ESD? Because you need a separate data set to train the method, yes. right? We, we did the simulation for the uh, 90 days, for the complete summer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, but we, we use the rest of the, we, we use from uh, 1979 to 2015, okay. the daily data from all these uh, years. Um, we isolated the, we, we didn't use the 2013 uh, summer. Okay, 
So you use all the viable years? And all the viable. You yes. take out just that sum. Yes, that's a, okay. like a cross-validation um, okay. calibration. Yes. More questions? Uh, which ESD technique you uh, in La Plata is working better? Ah, uh, we don't know. <laughs> we are exploring that. Yes, we don't know. Um, for instance, for extreme events, the analog method has uh, difficulties in representing very, very extreme events. Uh, so that's not a good um, method. Or we have to work on a. a improving the method, combining it with another methodology, probably. So we have to explore that. What are the, uh, the predictors more, the more significant the, uh, for your models, for your ESD models? Uh, well, that also depends on the, depends on the method, depends on the variable, depends on the region. Does not exist <laughs> like a com um, Main predictors, like for instance, in temperature, you can use temperature as well for the models or from your analysis. But precipitation is more complex. Yes. But moreover, have some like some selected predictors per region. Okay. So yes, we we try to use an, um, a predictors from a free atmosphere, not from surface. So we, we, we try not to use a temperature, surface temperature or precipitation as predictor because, um, well, I think Radan is going to talk about that, but it's, it's a kind of, yes, uh, he's going to talk about that tomorrow, but there are different uh, strategies to perform the downscaling. One of them is the perfect predictor uh, uh, strategy. So we are using that strategy. That means that the predictors should be perfect. And we are saying that the global model cannot represent surface temperature or, mean or precipitation. So the, um, that predictor is not perfect. So that's, that's why we don't use that. Otherwise, if we use temperature or precipitation, we are using another strategy that, that is the model output <coughs> statistic that is different. OK. <laughs> Unless one. Uh, 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 the performance of the re regional climate model has been shown over the autumn and also over the spring season. My question is, uh, why do you think that the regional climate models do not have uh, that good performance over the spring season? <sighs> That's a difficult question. <laughs> yes, we don't know. We have to to, to explore that. Um, it could be, well, I think it is related with the mechanism that uh, work on those seasons. Uh, that those are transition seasons. So you can have a, a, a fronts or a, a disturbances. A, passing through the, 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 the southern La Plata Basin, or also you can have um, a convective mesoscale uh, system uh, in that in the spring, especially. They are so more frequent in spring in the Yes, in they are more frequently in, in the spring, so the that's. The spring season is no. more noisy? No. no. She's talking about uh, convective that are more 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 frequent in in the spring, so that's a challenge. Okay, thank you, okay. Thank you. The next speaker is Michele Reboita from University Federal University of Itajubá, Minas Gerais. I need to put my presentation. She works in me.
It's work? Yes. Well, I work in Minas Gerais, but I study here. Then I'm in my house. Uh, I choose some examples of works using REG-CM for South America to present for you. Uh, then the title is Synthesis of Summer Climate Studies in South America with REG-CM4. This presentation has three parts. The first one, I will validate the REG-CM4.7, that is the new version of the module that uh, Erica told before about this new version. And after, I will talk about some climate projections with uh, REG-CM. And finally, I will talk a little uh, about seasonal climate forecast in South America. Starting with the REG-CM validation, uh, I used here a simulation that was performed by ICPT team. This simulation covers the South America domain, Cordex domain, with 25 kilometers with horizontal resolution and extends from 1979 to 2000. Oh, finish my charge. To 2014. Wow. Sorry. Uh, this simulation used the CLM 4.5. Then, in this figure, we can see the seasonal bias of precipitation for each season. And the scale, we have more precipitation in blue color and less precipitation in orange color. We can see a difference uh, in southern Brazil. During DJF, we have less uh, we have more precipitation simulated by the model compared to the observation that in this case is CPC and change from DGF to June, July, August, the bias changed the signal. We pass from a negative and we pass from a positive bias in summer to a negative bias in... Oh, good. No? Yes. A uh, negative bias in July, August. Over Amazon, the higher bias occurred in GJF, and this dry bias reduced from the seasons and almost disappeared during GJA. But when we use climate models, it's not only uh, important to see the bias of temperature and precipitation, we need to uh, uh, go beyond the, this kind of analysis. We need to show other things uh, like the pattern of the circulation, the atmospheric circulation. I will show some examples during the presentation. But now I have a question. How does REG-CM 4.7 represent the South American monsoon life cycle? For this, I have a little introduction. Most part of the precipitation over South America occurs during the summer compared to other periods of the year. Uh, in winter, the precipitation is uh, little in this part. And then the purpose here is to compute the onset, the mice, and the duration of the South American monsoon. We call this, uh, this precipitation in reality, these precipitations is associated with the South American monsoon. That is a combination of several atmospheric seasons that contribute to the precipitation. To determine the monsoon life cycle, I use the Bombard and Carvalho methodology that uh, analyzes uh, pants of precipitation for each year, we have 73 pentads. I put a table from Kowski 1988 that shows the pentads. We have 73 pentads along the year and the data of each pentad. The first pentad is from uh, 1 to 5 January 
and the last one is from 77, 31 December. After we compute the precipitation patterns, we use a derivative to find the onset and demise of precipitation. Why a derivative? Because we found the peak and the bottom of the curve to identify the data that the monsoon starts and the monsoon demise. But before to identify the data, the sun onset and demise will be represented only in the sectors that the precipitation is 60% of the year. Almost the precipitation over the, this part of the continent occurs from September into April. And the model, here we have CPC, that is the observation, the data observa uh, observa observed. And here is the model. The performance of the model is good. They uh, represent, the model represents well this pattern, that is more than 60% of the precipitation occurs uh, during September until April in these regions. And how? is the performance of the life cycle. In the first line, I put the CPC, and the bottom is the model. Here we have the onset, the mice, and the duration of the sun. The colors here uh, is the pentad from 50 until 60 for the onset, and here is 15 until 30 for the demise. Consider the sun onset. In CPC, the onset starts in during 8 to 22 October, and the model delays in approximately two pentads the sun onset. For the demise, the sun finishes between 17 to 31 March in this region, and the model advances in approximately two pentads. If the model um, delays the onset and advances the demise, the duration is shorter in the model, and we can see it in this figure. Uh, we have about 32 until 34 pentads of duration, the sun in the observation, while we have a shorter lifetime, about three and four pentads in the model. But the model uh, captures uh, the sun, the sun signal, but it has this um, bias. We can uh, see other, other, we can see perform others analysis to investigate the model performance. In this case, I we will show some features about large droughts in South America. I, I choose four episodes. Four episodes. Oh, finish. No, no finish. I <laughs> covered it. I choose uh, four events of droughts, three over Amazon and one over the southeastern Brazil. And the purpose here is evaluating if reg CM 4.7 captures the pattern of these droughts. This figure is to GJF 1998. In this period occurred a pronounced uh, drought in the western Amazon. Oh, one moment. In the western Amazon uh, sector of South America, a draw here. This figure is the observation in the period GJF, 1998. Here is the observation minus the climatology that uh, here we get to see the, we can see the draw, the drought. Uh, the model for the same period, model minus the model climatology and the model minus the observation. Here, in CPC, the drought is registered in the northern uh, Amazon. The model gets captured the signal, but uh, the signal is more pronounced. I will show the same figures for uh, two other cases. 
January, February 2005. We have a drought in this part of the continent, and the model uh, simulates the sino but weaker. In January, February, March 2010, the drought occurred in the north part of South America. The model captures the signal, but is large in the model. The drought is more severe compared with the observation. And the fourth case is the, the drought occurred in southeastern Brazil in 2014. Uh, the model uh, captured the signal, but in this case, it's very, very drier than the observation. Well, after we see the precipitation patterns, it's important to observe the circulation, the atmospheric circulation, to understand the, desvia the deviation that occur in the model. Then I put here the atmospheric circulation at 200 HPA. The first column is the observation, air interim, and here is the simulation. We have the co in colors the wind speed, and the, the lines is the, is, are the string lines. And in this third column, we have the bias, model minus uh, reanalysis. We can see that the model sometimes displays the position, the Bolivian high. In this case, Bolivian high is over the continent, and um, the model put it uh, westward and change the position of the trough, the northeast trough, in some simulations. Here is more similar, but in this case, the trough entering the continent. Regarding the upper, uh, upper jets, in general, the model under, uh, underestimates the intensity of the subtropical jets, the yellow color here. In surface, near surface, the performance of the model sometimes presents some bias, but in general is good. We have some displaces in the um, low level jet location. Here in the reanalysis, it in this case 2005 is crossing Amazonia from southeastern Brazil and is more displaced western in this case. In other cases, more similar to the reanalysis. And another point of the model is that the south, the subtropical high is more intense in the reg CM and it produces more, uh, more intense winds over the southeastern Brazil, in all cases instead. Well. Although the model has some bias, in general, they ca uh, he cap it captures the pattern of the circulation, the pattern of the precipitation, and can be used to other studies. It's important that we know the uh, weaker and the good representation of the model. Then, the second part of the presentation, I will show some examples of studies about projections, climate projections to South America. I will start with this study about cyclones, extratropical cyclones, in that we have two purposes. One, to verify the added value of the reg CM, a coupled in a global climate model, and simulated the cyclones over the South Atlantic Ocean, and the second goal was evaluate the precipitation associated with the extratropical cyclones over the ocean. Uh, in this case, we are using the RCP 8.5 scenario. These three figures show the cyclogens, the first position of the cyclones in the reg CM nesting in the global climate model. The global climate model that is 
had J, and here is an ensemble of five reanalyses, NCEP1, 2, r interim CFSR, and era 4 t I compute the mean and produce this figure with the special pattern of the cyclogenesis. We have three more intense nucleus uh, near the Southeast South America coast that is more um, that has more cyclones in these regions. And the REXCM is able to capture this signal, but the global climate model produces a bias, a positive bias in this region. Then we can conclude that REXCM adds skill to the global model. We have a better configuration in the pattern of the cyclogenesis in the regional climate model than in the global climate model. And a question is, the number of cyclones will increase or decrease in the future climate? Here we can see the difference, future minus present, in the regional climate model and in the global climate model. Both, mo both simulations indicate in blue colors a decrease in the number of the systems in the future. About the precipitation, we have here model, GPCP that is the observation, and the difference, model minus GPCP. We can see here the precipitation associated with the cyclones. In this part of the ocean, cyclones correspond to 90% of the precipitation, while near the coast, this value is about 40%. These values in the observation are 8% over the ocean and near the coast, 30%. About 10% of difference between observation and simulation. And the model, in general, simulates more precipitation over this part this ocean, do of the ocean. Because uh, sometimes there are more cyclones in simulation in this part. And in the future, what will happen? In the future, if you compare future with present, we can see less precipitation in this part. And this precipitation will decrease in about 15% in the future, associated with the less number of cyclones that is simulated, uh, that is projected to the future. OK, I will change the topic now. I will talk about energy and the agriculture. Uh, if you remember, the talk, my talk is about some studies. Then I will present short pieces of different works. Here we have an example for energy. Energy, we, we need shows, we need search for alternative uh, source of energy. And one alternative source is wind and we know uh, what will occur with the winds in the future because it's if the winds will increase we can put more farm wind farms install more wind farms if the winds decrease it's not good for the investors in wind farms i put here only an example for winter uh, it is winds at 10 meters high here to the near future, 2020 until 2050, and here is to the far future, 2070-2098. We can see in this figure is that the winds will increase in this part of the ocean, in this part of the North South America, uh, near southeastern Brazil, that it's important region for um, farms, wind farms, and in the southern Brazil, only in winter, there is a decrease in the wind intensity. In the other season that I don't present here, the maps, the winds will increase in the southern Brazil, and the southern Brazil is important. There are, uh, I think, three farms in the present there to capture the wind energy. And in the northeast here, in the 
in the coast of northeast, there is an increase in all seasons, and it is very important because this place, there is another uh, park, another place that uh, generates energy. Other information that we can with this with this figure is the position of the subtropical anticyclone, the South Atlantic subtropical cyclone. I highlighted with black color the position of an isoline in the present climate and the position in the future climate. In the future, the subtropical anticyclone will be wider than in the present. This uh, result is showed in an um, old article, I think, from Seth, Seth Hauscher, and uh, I will reproduce this result here. In the agriculture, well, for agriculture, we need to have, we need to have a kind of hour, um, number of hours, that the temperature will need to uh, reach some uh, value. I will show uh, in a moment. But before, some studies foc Fox agriculture are performed to this region, that is Minas Gerais state. Here we have a probability density graphic of air temperature. The green lines are the present three simulations of REG-CM nested in global climate models. And in red, we have the future, 2017 and 2095. We can see here that the curves displaced to right uh, position of the figure indicate that the mean temperature change in the future. That I it's a good example of figure that explains what is global climate change? The change of the mean of the temperature. Uh, it was computed for this area in red. And if the temperature will increase, what's the impact in the agriculture? Some kind of uh, crops, plants, needs a number of cold hours during the year to have a new vegetative, uh, new vegetative cycle to increase, to uh, growing again, okay? And uh, these figures shows different uh, for different temperatures, 7, 7, 9.5 and 13 degrees, the number of hours that we have with this kind of temperature or less. If you show here, we have the present climate, the future climate, and the far future, near future and far future. And then these colors, blue, dark blue, indicate m higher number of hours with cold temperatures. In the future, we have a decrease of the number of cold temperatures. It's not good for some kind of crops that needs a huge number of cold hours. The third part of this presentation is about seasonal climate forecast. Uh, Study the projections is very important to the decisions makers have information. But the agriculture uh, and the, the energy sectors need information about the climate in the next season. What will happen in three months uh, af ahead? What will happen one month ahead? This kind of information we have with seasonal forecast. We are checking the performance of REG-CM in to do this kind of job, the seasonal forecast. Then for this, we use REG-CM 4.6 nested in CFS V2. We test different cumulus parameterization schemes and the surface atmosphere interaction schemes. And here we have two simulations. 
one for February, March, April, and other for June, July, August of this year. Here is the result of the CFSV2 comparison. Uh, the model minus the observation that was CPC. Global climate model indicates uh, a negative bias compared with the observation in large part of South America, also in this season and June, July, August. But when we use the reg -CM of different uh, schemes, we reduce the bias compared with the global climate model. We can see it easily in this other figure that we performed the ensemble with the BATS uh, surface scheme and CLM surface scheme. Compared to global climate model that underestimates the precipitation, the bias was reduced by the uh, regional climate model. That is a good result to forecast the seasonal climate. Uh, another important uh, with this topic is about Alcântara. Alcântara is a place in northeast of Brazil that uh, has an operational center for rocket launching. In this part of the continent, uh, we need to forecast the winds because winds uh, disrupt is not good for the rocket launching. Then a uh, simulation, a uh, seasonal forecast was performed. We have three examples here, forecast to June 2017, July and August. The colors are the wind intensity over the continent. And the, this uh, bar indicates that the performance of the model was so good because the difference between model minus reanalysis was almost between 0 and 1 meters per second. It's an important result for this place because they are interested in work with rocks and other space uh, service. 10 meters, so Kleber? Venta 10 meters aqui, né? 10 meters high in this, in this case. Okay, I finished the presentation, and the more important conclusion is that the, my message, my, my most important message here is that the regional climate model adds value to global climate models, and you need to uh, put uh, um, energy and uh, uh, work to produce other results, and the re results that can be used in agriculture, energy to the society, to help the society, okay? Thank you. Questions? Uh, what kind of hardware do, uh, do you use for, for this uh, REC-ZM? Uh, do you use uh, a cluster here in... Ah, yes, you use cluster to perform the simulation. Is from the USP or from another institution? <laughs> Is it possible to access that? <laughs> use cluster from ICTP, cluster from USP, from Rosemary. But in your work, uh, you, so let's you did the same in several clusters? Are you talking yes, about? Oh, no. Uh, some part of the presentation where I validated the REG-CM, the simulation was performed in Italy. For the climate change scenarios, the simulation were, were performed with the other REG-CM version and in Italy. These uh, results from seasonal climate we performed in other machines. Here. No, in Kleber has a machine in CTI and the we have a small machine in Unife. But it's a small machine. Small, you not a... You don't need so much Because huh? for climate forecast, uh, I run in five, six months, not uh, 100 years. Right. And it's possible in a small machine. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Uh, in case of the seasonal forest cast, uh, what do you think uh, is the best configuration the, with the, well, in the Western Amazon for precipitation? We can see here, I think it's LM. Uh, so it's CLM. Yes, yeah, CLM is better. But okay. it's so good also. Okay, uh, what does about that the configuration, what that that means? Uh, oh, we ex it's more expensive to use CLM, but mm -hmm. expensive in terms of machine. Uh, okay. 30 degrees, 30 kilometers. 30 kilometers. No, degrees, no, <laughs> kilometers. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Uh, very impressive. Uh, I have several questions dash comments. Okay. <laughs> but I, I won't go through all. Uh, I just want to comment uh, on how, how do you deal with model biases? Because many of the results that you showed mostly on those impact analysis, um, I guess mo the model has bias in temperature, in winds. Yes. So uh, the question is twofold. First, how do you deal with the bias, and how do you deal with observations? Because we know that reanalysis is not good for 10 meters wind. So, uh, and the and the and the, um, and the message that you are trying to arise from from this uh, analysis is very very important. So, okay. That's uh, until now, uh, our results we. The didn't include the bias correction. The only work that I performed that I put a bias correction was in this paper uh, to analyze the winds. I, these results I use bias correction, a simple bias correction using um, means. Okay, but in the others uh, we don't we don't uh, treat don't uh, remove the bias. Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, just to complete the idea, is um, because the, the bias may not be um, uh, the same for the present and the future. So yeah. on the change, the, the climate change signal can change if you have bias or, or you don't. So maybe... Yeah, sometimes the bias is the same uh, uh, length of the, the, the signal. Yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. Okay. More cash? Less time? <laughs> uh, we okay. have one week to discuss about the results then. We can okay. Uh, now is uh, lunch time. We have um, uh, some. Huh? Yes. We have uh, an hour and a half to to lunch. It's it's an office because the the places to the restaurants are near here. Uh, the in front you have the physical physics institute. You can find there uh, a, re uh, a restaurant. I, if you in the left you you have uh, another one that is. FAO, the architecture, uh, architecture. Uh, you can have a lunch uh, in there. We have more places uh, here, but the, the, the FAO and physics are the near here. Uh, there is many people inside that knows the restaurant, Albert, Christina, can we can decker uh, we can join the groups to go to the restaurant okay Edius uh, Martog hi Return here the, to organize the lab section. 